I'm glad I'm here this morning. I am glad that I did not miss this. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you have, folks, if you'll turn to the book of Daniel, chapter number 2. Daniel chapter 2, if you'd like to stand this morning, and verse number 43, i read one verse of scripture, Daniel chapter number 2, verse 43, I'll tell you before I read this and before I preach this message this morning, I feel like that what I'm going to preach to you this morning is so very, very important for you to hear now in this late stage before the coming of the Lord. I would that you'd hear carefully what I'm going to say. Daniel chapter number 2 and verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Father, bless this holy book now. One more opportunity you've given me to stand and proclaim it, God, use me, Father, simply as a vessel. If that's if you use me as a vessel, I'm happy. That's all I want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to call your attention to verse 43 as I read it to you again. I'm going to read it to you slowly. And I want you to take into consideration what you have just heard. In the second chapter of the book of Daniel, we have a prophecy of successive world empires. Beginning with Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, was Babylon. And then you have the Medes and the Persians, then the Grecians, then the Romans. The Romans follow as say, the image has two legs. You have an eastern and western division of the Roman Empire. In 1050 AD, they separated over various issues. And the eastern empire was uh, located at Constantinople. Uh, Byzantium, Istanbul, Turkey, all the same place, a city that's had three names at least. The western branch of the Roman Empire was located in Rome, Italy. But what happens here in Daniel chapter number 2 is the culmination in feet of iron and clay. Iron and clay do not mix. But it's a strange thing that's mentioned to you here in verse number 43. It says, Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's a strange statement. The Apostle Peter said there are scriptures that are hard to be understood. And I do not for one moment profess to this morning to you that I understand all the Bible. I certainly do not. And I'm glad I don't because it's God's word. And there are times in Scripture that the Scripture is to be understood in a certain time. In other words, I believe there are passages in the Bible that tribulation saints will completely and fully understand more than we do in this age of grace. But the Scripture talks about something mingling itself with the seed of men. In plain words, it appears to me like we have a supernatural thing going on here in Daniel chapter number 2. This image that Daniel saw in the plains of Dura, or that he interpreted, Nebuchadnezzar saw it, that he interpreted, represents the Gentile kingdoms from 606 B.C. all the way down into the end. When's the end? The Lord knows the end. But it's a stone cut out of a mountain that smites that image on its feet. And when it does, complete and total annihilation of the Gentile kingdoms comes to a very quick and abrupt end. And it's all over with as far as Gentile kingdoms are concerned. So the times of the Gentiles are, will come to an end, and it will come to an end in a catastrophic manner, quickly, and it'll all be over with. But right, right before it does, according to Daniel chapter number 2, we have, we have supernatural intervention where something is mixing itself with the seed of men. Now, I don't profess for a moment this morning to be able to give you all the implications of that, but enough to give you to, for you to be able to think about what I'm preaching about today. Something mingling itself with the seed of men. Here's what the scripture says. In Genesis 6, when it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters born to them, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. They were fair, took them wives of all they chose. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. I'm a Bible believer, folks. I don't try to explain stuff away just because I don't understand it. Giants in the earth in those days. There is an abundant archaeological supply of archaeological evidence to prove the existence of giants. Some, if you can believe this, as tall as 30 feet or more. But in any event, giants in the earth in those days. Jude 1 verse 6 says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change to darkness to the judgment of the great day. Jude 1, 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner going, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Then Peter says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved to judgment. In verse 5, chapter 2 of Peter, he says, And spared not the old world. Now watch this. But save the eighth person. Noah was the oldest one on the ark. Yet Peter called him the eighth. That's because God started the new world with Noah and not with the rest of them. And save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood upon the world of the ungodly. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 6 and verse 9, we read the, this. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. The word in Hebrew translated perfect is tamim. Look it up and you'll find out that word means that he was pure in his genealogy, in his pedigree, that he was a direct descendant of Adam. No admixture of a, no adulteration of his seed from any angelic bloodline or anything of that nature. That Noah was therefore qualified to carry the seed of Genesis 3.15 where the promised Messiah would come, would come through Noah. And so Noah was perfect in his generations and walked with God. And the scripture says plainly that Noah is the one, his name means rest, who God carried over from the old world into the new and repopulated planet earth with the descendants of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So it's important to understand biblical history to understand where I'm leading you this morning. In the book of Genesis chapter number 6 or 5, rather a remarkable thing takes place. I'll go through it quickly. The names of the people who preceded Noah, when you look at their names individually, you get a statement from Scripture. And here's what it says. You have the son of Seth. Adam's son is Seth. Seth's son is Enos. Enos' son is Kenan. Kenan's son is Mahalalel. Mahalalel's son is Jared. Jared's son was Enoch. And Enoch's son was Methuselah. And Methuselah's son was Lamech. And so we follow their names on down to what they mean. And we get this statement from Genesis 5. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort. Their names mean something. Put them together, and that's the statement you get. The name Methuselah means that when he is dead, it will be sent. Or at his death, he will come. Relating to that, his death shall bring. And that's a prophecy as God is preparing the world for the flood and for the imminent judgment as he would bring damnation upon this earth. Now we move past that quickly to what I preached to you last Sunday morning. I told you that in 1140 A.D., a so-called prophet by the name of Malachi mentioned that 112 popes would follow in succession and the 112th pope would be the final pope. He would be called Petrus Romanus. I don't know if you looked it up this past week on the internet or not, but Petrus Romanus, according to this man, would be the final pope. In plainer words, Peter the Roman. And the last pope would usher in the end of the world, according to the prophecy of Malachi. He would usher in the end of the world and that judgment would come upon mankind, but God would preserve his holy Roman Catholic Church. If you remember, I mentioned to you last week, it's important to remember this. I told you how last week, back in the Old Testament, the days of, of Ahab, that a scene takes place in heaven. These spirits come before God. And God says to them, who will go forth and be a lying spirit 
in the mouth of his prophets. And this one said, I'll go. And God said, you go. And this spirit went forth and became a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. Told him it was fine to go into battle. But we know what happened to Ahab. We know that a man pulled a bow at a venture turned loose of the arrow, and that arrow found its mark, smote Ahab while he was in his chariot. The Bible said once he died, they washed the blood from the chariot of Ahab, that he had died on the battlefield. They first tried to go to Jehoshaphat, but Jehoshaphat had, by Ahab's instruction, put on a robe like the king. And Jehoshaphat said, I'm not the one you're looking for. He was spared, but Ahab died. Ahab believed a lie, and it cost him his life. This prophecy of Malachi in 1140 A.D. may very well be another illustration of God Almighty sending forth a lying spirit into the mouth of so-called prophets to bring together in the last days as he gathers, the, as he gathers together, according to the Ma book of Matthew, he gathers together the tares first, the scripture says, and then the wheat. And he's gathering the tares together. They're making their move for a one world government. And so it could be that this is exactly what's going on with this prophecy of Malachi. Is this prophet, this pope that's going to come up when Pope uh, Benedict XVI has resigned, the 28th day of this month, which is Thursday, is the last day of his pontificate. They will, they've called together a conclave. They have their cardinals. They will pick a pope to succeed him, to sit in the chair of Peter. And this pope, according to the prophecy of Malachi, will be the last pope to ever sit on, a th on, on, the, on the, the, the chair of St. Peter in Rome. Will this happen? God knows if it'll happen. But I know this. I know that the world is watching Rome. I know their eyes are fixed upon what's going on in the Vatican. I know that people are holding their breath. I know that 1,000 million, 200 million Roman Catholics on the face of this earth right now, that's a bunch of people, folks, are waiting, bated breath, to find out who the next Pope of the Roman Catholic Church will be. Whether it plays out as they intend for it to play out, I don't know. But what I'm about to present to you this morning should open your eyes and prepare you for what's coming. For we do live in the end of the age. We're living right before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too much is happening for this to be a simply passed off and say, well, this is the kind of thing. No, 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 my friend. It's time to wake up and start looking at what's going on. Did you know that in Mount Graham in the United States of America, there is a particular telescope. This telescope is used to view infrared images. It's quite a remarkable thing. And it's quite a remarkable thing in the sense that the Roman Catholic Church and the National Aeronautic and Space Administration, NASA, have joined together to build this thing. The Germans built it and to install it on top of that mountain. And it is focused toward the heavens and it is looking for something to come back to planet Earth. They're focusing out into the sky and they want to see what's coming and when it will appear. Do you know that they have a name for that scope? It's quite a thing when you consider what you're dealing with. It's called Lucifer. Of all names to give to a scope, Lucifer. They didn't name it in ignorance. Anybody that's ever read the Bible, Isaiah 14, knows what the word Lucifer means and exactly who it is speaking about. But listen to the, some of the statements that come forth from their astronomers and their professors in their universities. Now listen carefully. These are statements that are coming forth from the Roman Catholic intelligentsia, from the teachers, the Jesuits, the movers and the shakers in the Roman Catholic Church. Don't bother to go to some poor Catholic soul. And a lot of these Catholics out here are good people. They love the Lord. They don't know what's going on. I'm talking about the movers and the shakers, the hierarchy. I'm talking about the people who set the policy. Listen to some of the statements that are coming out from these people. Quote, our image of God will have to change if evidence of alien life on Mars is confirmed by scientists. A Vatican astronomer told the world's largest general science meeting yesterday. The modern concept of an anthropocentric God, now that's a big word that simply means man-centered, may have to evolve into a broader entity to take account of the insights of any intelligent alien culture. What's going on up here? Could it be that since these flying saucers began to appear, 
And all of this talk about UFOs and little green men and alien invaders from outer space and all of this stuff. Could it be that for the last 40, 50, 60, 70 years, this has all been a great ruse just to prepare for the final day of what's coming on this earth? Listen carefully. We need a proper sense of God, one derived in the dialogue between religion and science. There is no problem with science. It's science falsely so-called that the scripture has a problem with. Quote, while Christ is the first and last word, the Alpha and the Omega spoken to humanity, it is not necessarily the only word spoken to the entire universe. Bear in mind, these are intelligent people making these statements. They know what they're talking about. They are telling you that the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man of Colossians, the Bible said, by him were all things made, for him were they created, and without him nothing exists, nothing consists, nothing is anything, that the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty in flesh. They don't have that concept, yet they call themselves Christians. Note carefully, the discovery that the universe was populated by other intelligent species would not give humanity a sense of insignificance or fear, but one of being an integral part of a cosmic community. We would discover a church far beyond the confines of the earth and of any narrow interpretation of the Bible or other scriptures. Did you get this? Are you following what's going on? The Roman Catholic Church considers itself, and this is no doubt, folks, don't, don't doubt what I say, they are the church. Salvation is only through their church. And they are the ones who interpret the word of the living God and spoon feed you what they feel like you need. So such beings would be far ahead of us in science and related fields. But that their version of salvation might be based on a savior other than Jesus. Even a messianic member of their own race. These beings closer to God than man, perhaps even unfallen, would possess superior theology that would expand markedly our terrestrial understanding of redemption and knowledge of God. Something current Vatican theologians such as Professor Fundamental Theology at the Pontificate University della Santa Croce in Rome, connected with Opus Dei and gives his name, says, are you listening? We're talking about the professors that teach the priest that go out into these places and they minister the word of God. The viewpoint of the Vatican is looking up now, but they're not looking for the one you're looking for. A theologian at the University of Notre Dame imagined these godlike beings spread out across the universe on untold planets called to a special relationship with God. And that it is a mistake to think that our understanding of covenant, the reign of God, redemption, or shared life exhausts the modes by which divine power shares something of its infinite life. Such Catholic leaders believe these spiritually superior aliens may even have been created by God with the future redemption of humanity in mind. Beings who know their place in the eternal scheme of things to evangelize humans when the time is right. Now we're beginning to understand the, the agenda behind what's going on. We're looking for spiritual saviors, supernatural beings, to give us a further understanding about our condition and our relationship with God. No longer is the Bible the authority that we're fallen creatures, that we're condemned because of our sin and our sin nature. And only one can take that sin nature away from us and cleanse us in his precious blood. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the message anymore. The message is now from a superior alien race who has already been created long ago ages to come to mankind and be our savior. They've been sending messages down for a long time. You understand today, please understand what this preacher is telling you. This is not some wild bunch on Hayboy Corner out here in Loon Land. These are men in the highest positions of authority in the Catholic Church, and not just them. We'll get to more later. These are the men who are moving, the men who are directing. They have a profound influence 
on the policies of nations. When you deal with your children, you go to the courthouse, you go to the bank, you go to the, you go to the hospital. You, I don't know if you've noticed or not how things are beginning to change. It's an amazing thing for you to go to your doctor and your doctor ask you if you have any guns in your house. I don't know if you bothered to know about that or not, but that's the kind of thing that's going on now. What have you, what has the fact that you have guns in your house, what does a doctor want to know that for? The doctor doesn't want to know it. The government wants to know it. And they're using the doctor as a vehicle to reach into your privacy. Somebody's moving towards something and we need to wake up. It is entirely credible that in the enormous distance between angels and humans, there could be found some middle stage. That is, beings with a body like ours, but more elevated spiritually. Well, if you've ever dealt with a demon, you're dealing with a spiritual entity. And I'll tell you right now, demons are real. I, live, I was in a church one time where they didn't believe in demons. They didn't believe they were real. So they must have thought the Lord Jesus Christ was a lunatic. For he talked about demons directly and cast them out of people. The Bible says in the last days, we'll have doctrines of devils, of demons. We are literally saturated in our churches, in our culture, in our schools, in our government with demonic influence and possession. I'm not saying everybody's demon possessed, but I'll guarantee you one thing, their influence is real. It certainly is. Let's move out of the, out of the spectrum of the church and notice what the Muslim scholar says. He quotes the Quran, which is the Muslim holy book. He says, among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and whatever living creatures he has spread forth in both. And he has the power to gather them together when he will so pleases. Jahami or Jamihim is the Arabic expression in this verse, which specifically speaks of bringing together of life on earth and life elsewhere. When this meeting of the two will take place is not specified, nor is it mentioned whether it will happen here on earth or elsewhere. One thing, however, is definitely stated. This event will most certainly come to pass whenever God so desires. Do you know that in a country right here, in the good old U.S. of A., that church after church after church has pastors standing in the pulpit trying to show the similarity and the unity of the Christian faith and the Muslim faith. It's called Chrislam. They're trying to unite the two together. Now, Chrislam is, never, is not based on fact. The Muslim believes that Jesus lived, yes. Mary was his mother, yes. But they believe he's no more than a prophet. They do not believe that he's the son of God. They don't believe God has a son. Now, how can this Christian pastor stand in a pulpit and try to unite together a Muslim and a Christian under a common faith. That's an impossibility. Yet, if the spirit that drives that pastor is the same spirit that I'm reading to you about this morning, where the Muslim is looking up into the heavens too for a coming Savior, then maybe we have going on in these Chrislam churches part of this gathering together of the tares gathering together for the last days this false Christ that's soon to appear on the scene. Check it out. Before you get mad and just turn against it, check out what I'm talking about. There is no dialogue between a Muslim and a Christian. None. 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 So we go into the secular field. What do the professors out there in the world think about this? Furthermore, the expectation that aliens are headed our way extends to the non-religious worldview as well. The philosopher at the University of Rochester writes, I believe even responsible scientific speculation and expensive technology of space exploration in search of other life are the peculiarly modern equivalent of angelology and utopia or demonology and apocalypse. In plain words, he believes that it's definitely a good endeavor. That we can learn from more advanced societies in the skies. The secret of survival is the eschatological hope that motivates, or at least is used to justify, the work of exobiologists. Yes, our Savior is going to come. He's going to come down, and they're looking for him. 
but he's not mine. In addition to their obviously superior technology, they are credited with a superior wisdom and moral goodness, which would, on the other hand, enable them to save humanity. We're not talking about a professor in the Catholic Church. We're talking about a secular professor in a secular university, and they're not alone. They're growing by leaps and bounds. Thus a belief in godly aliens that will ultimately come in contact with man has wide interfaith acceptance among secularists, spiritualists, and the world's largest religions who seem ready and even excited about embracing their official disclosure moment. Yes, we're there. We are at the door. There is an emerging church rising up in America, folks. I've been telling you about it over and over again. They're pointing people to Rome. The evangelicals in this country are headed to Rome. The apostate Christendom, however you want to define it, is headed to Rome. And as I said to you a moment ago, Chrislam is certainly headed for Rome. They're all headed back to Rome. Remember this. Remember this, in the book of Revelation chapter number 17, it talks about a woman that sits on a beast on seven hills. There's only one city, and there was no question that even Catholic, even Catholic authorities, even their own interpreters say, that's Rome. That's Rome. But they put a different spin on it. In Revelation 17, it says that she is guilty of the blood of the martyrs, that she's trafficked in the world from generation to generation. Now, folks, I know the kind of preaching I'm giving you this morning make people mad. I know that. You, want, you call me a bigot. You want to call me whatever you want to call me. But the truth of the matter is I have a responsibility to teach to you the truth. I just told you, I just told you that the leadership and so much of the leadership in the Roman Catholic Church is looking for some kind of an extraterrestrial, supernatural, super spiritual, super moral being to come down. Not only that, I don't have time for it this morning. That's connected with a serpent. They even say it's connected with a serpent. And this being that's come down is going to lead them on into salvation. This world is being prepared for the greatest deception that's ever come upon the face of the earth. Secular authorities are teaching it, and so are Muslim authorities. That's what will join them all together. What will bring them together is not a common belief in individual personal salvation. What will join them together is a common belief in the salvation of humanity. That's what the message is all about. That's what the secular world preaches day in and day out is the salvation of secular humanity. You need to be saved individually. You need to be born again by the grace of God. And I'm going to tell you something right now. There is one coming from above who's the Savior of mankind. And he's not coming as a little green man. He's not coming in a spaceship. This same Jesus that went away is coming again in like manner. He's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's coming on a white horse in power and great glory. He's coming to take authority from this earth. He's coming to demand what belongs to him and take it by force. That's what I'm talking about this morning. And you won't be deceived because you belong to him if you know his name and he knows your name. He'll shout your name and call you up from this world seven years before he manifests himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He will come and shout the names of the saints of God and catch us up to meet him in the clouds. That's called the rapture. Any moment at any time. I could, I'd could. i love to be up here preaching the word and all of a sudden I'm gone. I disappear before your very eyes. I'd love for that to happen. That would be the greatest desire in my life for that to take place. But I'll tell you right now, a deception that is unprecedented, that my friend will blow your mind away, is just around the corner. All of this stuff about UFOs, all this stuff about extraterrestrials, all this stuff about E.T. has been setting the, setting the stage, laying the groundwork for what's about to happen. Now let me give you something that's very practical, something that you can latch on to. Something that you can take out that back door with you this morning. This right here, folks, is as real as it gets. This is what's going on in the Congress and the Senate right now in the United States of America. Here's the headline. Will Americans soon not be able to buy, sell, or get a job without a global ID card? They're pushing it right now. They're pushing it. They're pushing it. And if it becomes law, you'll either take it or you won't be able to buy, you won't be able to get a job, you won't be able to get an airplane ticket, 
you won't be able to function in this society and they're pushing for it right now. A global ID. They are unrelenting. They don't stop. If they don't get their way today, they'll come back tomorrow. If they don't get what they want this year, they come back next year. They will have a one world government. They will have a one world religion. They will have a one world economic system. They will have a one world savior. And it's not the Lord Jesus Christ. And thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift that I'm leaving here. I'm leaving this place. I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And Savannah will go with me. Hallelujah. Amen. Have you ever been convicted like that? Do you know what that means? I know you've been to church and I know you feel good and I know you've had an inspirational pumped up message and I know you go out and all this and that. I'm sure all that's happened, but have you ever been convicted that you're a lost sinner, that you need to be saved? Have you ever felt the dread come on your soul that to die without him is to die in damnation? Have you ever had that happen? Because that precedes conversion. May it happen in the name of Jesus. Father, in thy name we pray. I've delivered what you gave me. I've preached your word. Now, Father, it's in their hands, Lord. I'm clear of it. The burden's gone from me. I've told the truth. I know that not only will these people in this house hear this, but other people will hear it on the Internet. They'll hear it later in other places. When they hear it, I pray that they'll think about it and think about what I said and then look around them and see how it applies. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. Let's stand up this morning. Page 382 in your all American. <clears throat> 382. <clears throat> A global ID card. My, my. <laughs> Being pushed by the Bilderbergs. You know who they are. Don't you come. We all may be home sooner than we think. Come home. Don't you come? Don't you come? Won't you come? Come unto me, he says, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of soul. You shall find rest for your souls. Won't you come? If I belong to a church and the teachers and movers and shakers in that church was teaching this kind of thing, I'd feel an obligation from God to either leave it or confront them. Wouldn't you? I mean, that's as anti-Christ as it can be. That's to say that the Lord Jesus didn't do it when he died at Calvary. That's to say the blood atonement wasn't sufficient to wash your sins away. That's to say that God's issue with mankind won't be worked out on this earth, that he's got something out here for it to happen. It'll be finished here, folks. Before he ever populates there, he finishes it here. Amen. He finishes it here, and he did. There's no other Savior. There's no need, Dad. He finished it. What he did was enough. One sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of the Father, till he, waiting till his enemies made his footstool. 
No, you can't. That's it. Listen, it's heresy and blasphemy to try to add to the work of Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolute and complete, once and for all and forever. Jesus is, Jesus is absolutely everything you need. Absolutely. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's an affront to him. It's an affront to him to try to add anything to it. As if some miserable thing we can do can add to or improve upon what he did. Can't do it, folks. One God. One God. One mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Bless his holy, sweet name. Bless his righteous name. Bless the name of the Son of God. I exalt him and I praise him and I lift him up. He's been good to me. He's why I'm here today. I love him. He loves me. I am his and he is mine. If I die in the next five minutes, I know where I'm going because I know whom I have believed. I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I know my sins are forgiven. I know him in my heart and in my soul, not up here, down here. Go in the darkest hour of my day, I cling to him and call upon him and say, Lord Jesus, you're my love. You're my life. You're my future. There's nothing outside of you. You're everything there is, everything there was, and everything there ever will be. In the name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's no name like Jesus. That name is the name above every name. For it's the name of humiliation. It's the name that God gave him. He's not the only one that had the name of Jesus. We find followers of the Lord later on the book of Acts named Jesus. But he's Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ. And there's not another like him. Amen. Hallelujah. Sing one more verse, brother.